Hello everyone and welcome to my talk at the new and improved virtual London's Calling 2020. Uh, my name is Mick Wheeler, I'm a software engineer at Ovo Energy uh, based in Bristol. I've been working on the Salesforce platform for uh, more than 10 years now, uh, most of that time as a developer. And I'm here today to tell you about microservices inside of Salesforce with platform events and change data capture. So let's begin. So first, what are microservices? Well, the, the key is in the name. Microservices are small, independent services that perform a specific purpose. You can think of it like a robot in a car factory, and I'll expand more on that example in a moment. These services are loosely coupled. They don't know or care about the other services. The services must be testable, maintainable, and deployable independently. They need to be as self-contained as possible. And an application is composed of many of these services. They all have to work together to make the application function. So let's go back to our robot in a car factory analogy. So you, you're building a car, you have a car factory, you have many robots that do lots of different things. You can think of these robots as your services. So you might have a robot that welds, you might have a robot that paints. Both of these robots perform a specific purpose, weld panels together or paint the car. They both don't really know or care about one another. Uh, the welding robot doesn't really know or care what happens to the panels it's put together after, after they've left. And they can be swapped out or maintained or tested or changed independently of one another. If you need a new welding robot or an improved painting robot, both of these things can be swapped without the other robots in the factory knowing. But without all of these little robots working together, you don't have an application or you don't have a car. So that's a, a fairly simple example of microservices and how they work. So the next thing we need to understand is what is an event-driven architecture? These microservices are all well and good, but they need to be able to talk to one another. And that's where an event-driven architecture comes in. You can think of an event-driven architecture sort of like Twitter, and I'll explain that further in a moment. The architecture generally consists of an event bus with topics, publishers, and consumers. In our case, our event bus is platform events, which underneath uses a technology called Comet D. All communications between our microservices have to go through this bus. They publish and consume from this bus, but they never directly talk to one another. And this allows for the loose coupling and easy changes that we spoke about earlier. If one service is no longer fit for purpose, it can be swapped or upgraded without affecting the others. So let's go back to Twitter. When you're, when you're on Twitter and you're following the London's Calling hashtag, that's a topic. So you write a tweet saying, I'm listening to Mixed Talk at London's Calling with the hashtag, and you're now a publisher. You've published to that topic. And the person next to you is, is scrolling through Twitter and they see that tweet because they're following the hashtag as well. They've now consumed it. So this sounds great, but how does it work on Salesforce? So Salesforce platform events allow us to create these topics. These are our platform event definitions. It allows us to publish, insert these records, or subscribe to, trigger upon these records, messages. Change data capture allows us to subscribe to changes in records without object triggers. This is very similar to platform events, but these are supplied for you by Salesforce. You just need to turn them on. These record changes are published as events in the same way our own events are. Both of these features can be used in front and back end services and even off platform. You can use triggers, batches, lightning, visual force, and even external applications. For example, in the front end, you can use what's called the EMP API to listen for platform events and make direct changes to the user interface. Uh, likewise, you can use triggers to listen for platform events and make changes in the backend. So what about these external applications outside of Salesforce? Well, platform events and CDC are available externally. We can consume these in our off-platform applications quite easily. And external services can use Comet D as the underlying technology to publish and subscribe to these events. We can emit events from our external applications or we can listen to events in our external applications. 
A caveat here is that our application needs to be able to authenticate to Salesforce in order to connect to the event bus. But that's quite simple. The advantage here is this application can, or this service, can live entirely outside of Salesforce. It could be in Heroku, as in the example we're going to see shortly. It could be in Google Cloud Platform, AWS, any cloud provider. It could even be on-premise. Or it could even be a small IoT device. Uh, the Comet D library is quite well documented, and I e wrote a, a library for Arduino, so I could publish and subscribe to platform events from microcontrollers. It's very flexible what you can do with this. So why is this a better approach? Flexibility is the main benefit. When things are loosely coupled, change becomes very easy. We can just swap out or upgrade the parts when we need to, the services when we need to. Using an event bus, we all speak the same language. Regardless of the application or services internal design, the language it's written on, where it's uh, written in, where it's hosted, any of that, as long as we can all communicate with the event bus, the, all the little pieces or services of our application can talk and work together regardless of how they're built. And services no longer need to be on the same platform. As mentioned before, they can be anywhere as long as they can speak to the event bus. And this allows service ownership to be distributed. Different teams can own different services, allowing them to specialize and maintain their service individually of others. But not everything is perfect. There is inherent complexity in this approach, especially if you have a small handful of services. You need an event bus, you need topics, you need to publish and consume. If you've only got two things, perhaps they're better just talking to one another directly. But obviously on the flip side, the more services you have, the more this approach makes sense. The other issue is cross-domain services and features can be hard. You might need to have bigger services than you would like, or you might need to implement features multiple times slightly differently in different services. So this is not a silver bullet, this is not a magic approach, but it can be a good approach for designing things on and off the Salesforce platform. So let's have a look at how it can work on platform. So in this example, we've got an opportunity and invoices need to be generated when that opportunity is closed. So we're looking at the diagram here. When we modify the opportunity to close win it, the change data capture, capture record, uh, change data capture event, sorry, is generated onto the event bus. We have our first service, this apex trigger, which listens for that event and generates its own invoice request platform event. That platform event is then fired onto the event bus and picked up by our next service. This service listens for that invoice request platform event and based on the content of it, generates an invoice and fires its own platform event back onto the event bus. The final service listens for that response platform event, takes the contents of it and saves it as an attachment attaching it to the opportunity record. So you can see we've got three services here that support our invoicing flow. Two, uh, all three of these are on Salesforce. But what if we decide our Salesforce solution is no longer fit for purpose? We don't wanna generate invoices on the platform anymore. Well, we can move that piece of the process off platform. So with this approach, the first half stays the same. We modify the opportunity record, a change data capture event is published. The trigger picks that up and publishes an invoice request platform event, but this is where it changes. Instead of our on-platform Salesforce code picking that event up, we have an invoice generation service that runs on Heroku. That listens for these events and generates an invoice. It then fires the same invoice response platform event from earlier, and our on-platform code at the end picks it up and attaches it to the opportunity record as before. So enough talking, let's have a look at a demo of how this process actually works. So here's one I recorded earlier. So we've got our opportunity record as discussed before. This one's just about ready to be closed one. It's got a couple of products on it. So you can see all that information here and we're going to go ahead and mark that as closed one. 
So that's going to save, and this is going to kick off our whole process. So let's have a look at that process. Going to switch to VF code in a moment, a VS code in a moment. And here's our first service, here's our first trigger. It's fire, this listens to the change data capture event and fires the invoicing request platform event. You can see here, we get the information from the opportunity and the opportunity line items that we need. That then generates a platform event as defined down here. And then finally, once we've got that platform event, all we do is fire it. That gets picked up by our next service that's a trigger, but then fires our invoice generation service. So we take that platform event in, and what it does is use Visual Force in this case to generate a PDF and fire another platform event with the contents of that PDF in it. And finally, we save that PDF as an attachment as discussed before. So we take the contents of that platform event and create an attachment. So if we flip down to notes and attachments, we can now see we have an invoice. So that invoice was generated entirely on Salesforce. If we have a look in the debug log, we can see the bouncing backwards and forwards that we'll show in just a moment between the various pieces of infrastructure in Salesforce. So we can also see that we've got change data capture configured for the opportunity object for this to work. So what we're going to do now is we're going to turn off the invoice generation on platform. So we're going to disable the trigger that listens. So once that's done, we're going to go and turn on our Heroku service. So we've got that turned on. We'll just go and make sure that that has started up successfully. We can see it is starting now. And we can see it's now running. So we're going to have a look at that service now. So this is just a simple Node.js application using JS Force and a PDF kit. It listens for the platform event. It logs in and listens. It generates a PDF invoice. And once that's done, it fires the platform event. This is very similar to our Salesforce code, except running on Heroku external to Salesforce. So let's flip back to Salesforce and we're going to have a look at this process again. So we'll move our opportunity back one stage so we can trigger the process. Move it back to closed one and we'll save that opportunity. And now we're going to have a look at the debug logs, we can see these events bouncing backwards and forwards. But this time you'll note that we don't call our on-platform code. We don't call our uh, a visual force page to generate the invoice. So if we now have a look at our opportunity again, we're going to go back down to notes and attachments. And we're going to see our shiny new invoice generated with our off-platform invoicing service. So as you can see, it was very easy to swap between the two. So let's go back to the slides and talk about what we learned here. So we learned that you can very easily build services both on and off the platform that can perform your business logic. We can build these services using the same event bus, talking to each other in the same way, and we can decide how loosely or tightly coupled these services are. We can decouple them using platform events, or we can couple them more tightly, in this case, through the opportunity object, using change data capture. Your architecture can become more complex. So you need to take care to ensure that it is the correct level of complexity. As I mentioned earlier, if you've only got two services, then maybe this is not the best approach. And you know, even for this particular approach, it's maybe slightly over complex. But this is a nice little example that we can show. And once you start down this path, you can take things a lot further. Salesforce itself can become a microservice, maybe less emphasis on the term micro, within your organization. This is something we actually do at Ovo Energy. Our Salesforce instance is just a part of our broader energy platform, and it is communicated to and communicates to other services via Kafka, which is another event bus. Other ones exist like RabbitMQ or MQTT for microcontrollers and small IoT type devices. 
There's some caveats with this though. You do need middleware in order to connect Salesforce to other event buses like Kafka. You could use a tool like MuleSoft or you could build your own. You could use Node.js on Heroku. You could build something on Google Cloud Platform, whatever actually works for the approach you're trying to take. But this approach allows for huge scale applications and platforms. You can have thousands of services working together. In, in OVO itself, we have hundreds of microservices that all work together to provide our energy platform, all communicating via Kafka, all following the similar paradigm to which I've described here. So I'd like to thank you so much for tuning in and watching my talk here at London's Calling. Uh, the next slide contains a bunch of really good resources. You can either scan the QR code if that's convenient for you, or there is a link on my website at mickwheels.net slash index.php slash Dreamforce 2019 resources. Obviously, I did this talk at Dreamforce in 2019, so it's the same set of resources there. And all of the code that I used in this talk is available on GitHub at the repo link at the bottom of the slide there. So you can go and download this code, run it yourself, have a play with it, and see if you can put it to use in your organization. But once again, thank you so much, and thank you for attending London's Calling online.